Well, it's very nice to be here. Thank you all for coming, especially in the rain. And um, what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about what happens when different forms of local scientific knowledge collide and how they interact. We have a picture that we inherited from the 1920s and 1930s about how knowledge and innovation in science functioned. And it began with a picture that the positivists wanted to use as a cudgel against the metaphysical systems and clericalism of Austria. And they thought they could do this by bringing things down to logic on the one side and to immediate sense experience on the other. And so they thought that innovation and change in science occurred in an accumulative or aggregative way that would minimize the use of theory, which was seen more as a way of codifying the accumulated knowledge and the relationship of sense perception through the new Frege-Russell logic that had been developed, and that scientific perception and language would come in bits, little bricks that could be built together of the form smell ozone here 8 a.m., and that by using the logical connectives and the immediate sense perceptions that you would be able to construct something that was out of the reach of metaphysical systems. And so if you wanted to make a kind of schema of this picture, of this idea, it was that theory changed, but theory was a kind of epiphenomenal thing. It was not of great weight. And what really mattered was observation and its logical connectives. So as time went on from left to right, theories successively got better in, able, in being able to grasp a larger and larger percentage of the observed world, and the observed world was getting larger. And this represented the kind of golden thread that went through science and that held it in one piece and gave what they hoped would be a unification project of science its merit. And this got a political cast in the 1930s as it was seen to be uh, a weapon against the vagaries of nationalism and Nazism that were dividing the world and that instead one could ground some a language of science which was cumulative and aggregative and would represent uh, a world view, a way of living, and not just a way of doing science. After World War II, and I'm schematizing ruthlessly here, uh, there developed <laughs> through the work of Thomas Kuhn and many others uh, a, a kind of revolt against this aggregative, accumulist picture of knowledge. And their view was that, in fact, theory, far from being secondary, was actually the bedrock. It was the beginning of things. And theory subordinated observation. Um, attending too much to experiment was a mistake. Instruments were not even in the picture. And the goal was to study through perceptual psychology and the philosophical moves of Wittgenstein and others, Kuhn, Mary Hesse, Gerald Holton, Hansen and others began to see a world of science that was framed to such a degree by theory that what counted as a valid observation itself was dictated from above by the framework of theory. And so you had a picture uh, from experimental psych uh, psych perceptual psychology, for instance, where people had noticed that if you flip through cards uh, rapidly, uh, that you wouldn't even notice that one of them was a red card as opposed to a spade, and so it would simply be assimilated to your expectations. This is a simple example. Uh, there are others, of course, like the famous duck-rabbit gestalt switch that seem to indicate for people uh, of this anti-positivist generation in the 1960s and 1970s that theory dictated what counted as what. There is no perception of this figure that is simply neutral line. It is either ears or a beak on the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen. But we never have the view of raw perception outside of the framing conceptual structure of our theories. And that was fundamental for that generation of anti-positivists who saw theory as framing the observations to such a degree that science itself fell into islands. Um, in Kuhn's metaphor, these were like ships passing in the night, or elsewhere he talks about a conversion experience that could take you from one way of looking at the world to another, which would include or disinclude, um, dis include or exclude certain observations altogether. There was no magic strand that carried through and held science together. Instead, science was fundamentally 
discrete in this sense. So an example might be special relativity, where the positivists saw this as this long sequence of careful experiments that showed to a better and better degree that there was no ether. Ether was, couldn't be more than this effect and that effect and so on. And then asymptotically, Einstein simply put the capstone on, on, on that arch and said, there's no ether. Um, the anti-positivist reading was very different. It said that in, the, in, a, in one world, the Newtonian world, space and time were parts of the sensorium of God. And in the Einsteinian world, space and time was the behavior of rulers and clocks. And they really had very little to do with one another. Even if in a formal sense you could show certain correspondence between the equations, that the term t or the term x in those equations referred to a different world, one to God and the other to a ruler. Um, and so in the particular case of looking at relativity, Newtonian theory and his picture of the deity and its role in it shaped observation, and Einsteinian theory shaped Einsteinian observation, and never the two should meet. The problem is, from a, the point of view of the history of physics, is that the big breaks of theory, like 1900 with the quantum, 1905 with special relativity, 1915 with general relativity, 1926 with uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, are good breaks in the history of theory, but they don't correspond to much of anything in the change of instrumentation or experimentation. And in fact, um, a lot of my work has been looking at these different subcultures of physics, at the way experiments work and way experimenters see the world, at the way instrument makers see the world, and at the way theorists see the world. And the question is, First, to understand the different rhythms and dynamics of the changes within these cultures, how they fabricate knowledge in their domain. And then the question is, how do they put this together? And that becomes the, dominate, the dominant strand of, of, of work that has um, occupied me for a very long time. So if one wanted to make a periodization, again, in the same crude, cartoonish way as I indicated for the positivist and anti-positivist picture, we would see that there were breaks at the level of experiment, breaks at the level of instrumentation, breaks at the level of theory, but that it was a contingent, not a necessary fact, that these should occur at the same time. And in fact, there's good reason to expect they wouldn't occur at the same time. If you have a brand new theory, you're a lot more likely to be able to persuade your colleagues to believe it on the basis of instruments that are known to work rather than saying, I have a new theory that's going to require a new instrument that you don't trust and a new experimental procedure that you've never seen before. So you actually have some incentive in the construction of knowledge to intercalate these different strands. Then the question is, I mean, this seems to me more or less a straightforward um, historical empirical fact that experiments, instruments, and theories don't co-periodize, that 1905 doesn't correspond to much of anything in the history of instrumentation or the development of the cloud chamber doesn't instantaneously change theory. Um, and then the question is, how do, if it's true that these different subcultures of physics actually parse the world differently, <coughs> proceed with different rhythms, organize their demonstration strategies in different ways, that is to say, have different ways of securing the knowledge, please come in. Um, uh, then the question is, how do they communicate at all? Doesn't this, this simply redouble the problem with which we began, namely the Kuhnian disjunction makes it impossible to understand the felt continuity of science over time by scientists working in these fields. They don't actually suddenly <coughs> fail to talk in uh, 1905. And the question then is, how do these different strands interact? So what the, 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 the principal idea of what I call the trading zone is that we've come to see the development of science as having important local effects. That is to say, to understand the development of a new technique in biology or chemistry or physics, that we can't treat ideas as if they're freely floating things and that we need to see, in fact, how in detail the particular circumstances of instruments and related technologies that are available at the certain place or computational techniques and so on. And we need to sort of see the origin of science in its particularity in a particular spot. 
At the same time, this has been associated or married to a completely non-local idea of language uh, in the work of Kuhn and even much more modern uh, figures in the history, sociology, and philosophy of science. In that picture, you go from sort of speaking Newtonian to speaking Einsteinian, and it's supposed to resemble the radical difference between trying to translate between, say, French and German. The problem is that this picture of a local construction of knowledge and a non-local picture of language doesn't go together very well. And we can ask the question, how, when, say, a string theorist wants to talk to an algebraic geometer or a chemist and a biologist want to talk at the beginning of what we come to know as biochemistry, how do they, in fact, speak to one another? Is it the kind of radical translation that was advocated by the anti-positivists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And I think that's not what, in fact, happens. What happens is much more like what happens in Alsace-Lorraine or in the creoles and pigeons and jargons that exist, that are built up at the real thick boundaries in natural language. That is to say, we're quite used to the formulation of specific uh, jargons, a localized set of terms that develop in the coordination, say, between a fishing community and a wheat-growing community on the beach of their exchange, so to speak, with pigeons, which are more functional exchange languages that have particular applications. They might be, for instance, a specific trade language. And creoles, which are full-fledged interlanguages, which are developed to the point where you can, so to speak, grow up in them. And what's interested me is to take these ideas that come from anthropological linguistics and to look at what happens in the formation of knowledge, especially in the relationships of different scientific domains, whether they're different subcultures within a specific field like physics or between physics and biology or biology and chemistry or one of the sciences and fields outside of the range of the sciences in the more technological domains, whether it's military technology or computational technology, and to look at the way that language is coordinated, language and techniques get coordinated in this thick boundary area and how it develops from very specific coordinations at the level to scientific, of scientific jargons to scientific pigeons to scientific creoles. And this isn't to make, I think it's important to note that my argument is not that there are pure fields like physics and biology, chemistry, and then hybrid fields. It's in fact everything is hybrid in this way. Physics that we know today as the pure field of physics is an amalgamation, very complicated one, of different branches of thought that go back a long way, partly from the new experimentation that has, owes a lot to crafts in the early modern era, to uh, the antique exact sciences that dealt only with static or pure systems from the time of Plato and before, and these mixed fields of experimental and mathematical uh, combinations that helped get got formed in what we call the scientific revolution of the 17th century. If one thinks about these trading zones, these coordinative zones where techniques and language are built up, from, say, a specific set of shared terms and techniques between biology and chemistry to biochemistry, which has journals and meetings and biochemists, um, uh, that this is something that occurs over time. And rather than the picture of translating in a radical way French to English, this idea of a diachronic concept of the coordination of knowledge in both its material and its, um, and its linguistic form is something that can give us some, a, a, a process. Locality, then, is also something that can help here because unlike saying English as if it was something uh, universal, that we can look at language as associated not with a free-floating entity but with particular places and persons, something that we can see in its detail. And contextuality, because scientific technical languages always evolve in the wider world at the intersection, for instance, in the 20th and 21st century of science and the military. So, for example, if you want to understand the development of computer simulations, it's impossible not to see that in the context of understanding neutron diffusion in attempts to model the first atomic bomb or the very complicated hydrodynamic and nuclear models that were used to build a hydrogen bomb. And those techniques carry over in a very immediate way into the development of physics 
in the 19, late 1940s and beyond. A specific example of the way we might see these trading zones would be to go back to the example of special relativity, where one of Einstein's great and famous innovations was to say that time needed to be reconsidered to be nothing other than the behavior of properly synchronized clocks. If you wanted to know what was simultaneous right here, that's not a problem. If the train, Einstein says, arrives in front of my nose at 7 o'clock, I mean just that the small hand of my watch is pointing to the 7. But if I want to say it arrived at the next town over there at 7 o'clock, I need some way of coordinating those clocks. And he suggested the simple but profound notion that you should coordinate your clocks by exchanging a light signal between the two clocks, send it on a round trip, see how long it takes, and then setting the distant clock to be half that speed, that half that time difference when it receives the signal. So if it takes two seconds, these are faraway towns, uh, to go back and forth, <laughs> then, uh, then we know that uh, it could take one second to go one way, and so I flash my signal at 12, and you set your clock at 12 plus one second. And for Poincaré, who was also working on similar problems in the late 19th century, he began by being head of the Bureau of Longitude in Paris, and his job was to figure out how to synchronize clocks all over the world through the French telegraphic network, which was going to give him a way of determining the longitude of places like Brazil, which was rather important if you didn't want your ships to all sink. So, um, and then he came to understand that this was a routine matter in finding longitude and coordinating clocks, and he began to use that as part of his arguments within the philosophy of science about what it meant to talk about simultaneity at all. So in that intersection between philosophy, this burgeoning field of philosophy of science that he helped create, and the technology of time synchronization, this notion of clock coordination became very important, which I've marked in the red square marked T. And then in 1900, he realized that there was actually a kind of triple intersection, a kind of, this is a very minimal trading zone. This is a, what's in common between these fields of the electrodynamics of moving bodies and his relativity theory, the technology of time synchronization and making maps of the world, and the philosophy of time was simply this notion of how to coordinate clocks. So this notion of coordinating clocks stood at the intersection. If you say, is it really part of relativity, really part of longitude finding, or really part of the philosophy of time, that doesn't make much sense. It's like asking whether uh, which road the intersection is in. The intersection is defined by the crossing of those different roads. And this sort of thing is what's interested me in many different contexts. During World War II, for instance, the atomic bomb project looked like it was going to grind to a halt. Vigner wrote the President of the United States, Roosevelt, a letter saying that if the engineers and the physicists and the theorists didn't um, start doing things in coordination, Hitler would win the war. And uh, Compton came down and drew this chart about how the engineers, the development people, the theorists, the physicists, and the chemists had to speak to one another. And they had to develop languages to make that coordination. And now we see in, in the current world all sorts of places where these local coordinated trading zones occur. We see that, for instance, in the nanotechnology building just around the corner, where surface chemists, electrical engineers, and atomic physicists have to sometimes very laboriously learn to be able to coordinate their terms. How each of them uses the term nanotube, for example, is somewhat different. And yet, there's enough in common for them to begin to construct first a jargon, then a pigeon, and then ultimately a creole. In string theory, at the high end of abstraction, the geometers, the algebraic geometers, and the field theorists had a very hard time first speaking to one another. And they, too, have had to develop commonalities, not only in the objects they're talking about, but the nature of intuitions and demonstrations and so on. And simulations, as I've mentioned, cross many different scientific fields. So this is the nano building. This is an example of a simulation. But these Monte Carlo simulations wander back and forth among many different domains, statistics, physics, nuclear weapons, astronomy. And even in particle physics, uh, or especially in particle physics, one begins to see ways in which the myriad of different industrial and scientific groups have to coordinate the different parts. And a big detector like this, which was never built, analogous ones were built at CERN, just about to start up 
um, each of these different colored parts of the detector is actually owned by different groups around the world, and the coordination of the knowledge that they produce in these different sectors is actually fundamental to demonstrating anything at all. So, in a way, what I'm these are the kinds of concerns that interest me. What are not to say something like there is um, symbiosis between fields, not to say there's collaboration. That seems to me a little bit like Moliere's famous, it puts you to sleep because of its dormitive powers. I know they're, I know they're collaborating. That's the problem, not the answer. Interdisciplinarity doesn't tell you anything. That just labels the site where we need to dig. And what I think we should be digging for is to understand quite precisely what are the shared techniques, what are the shared instruments, what are the shared theoretical notions, how do they work, how do they expand, how do they relate to the larger context of use in the constituent subcultures that are trying to trade, what works in the coordinative zone, what doesn't work, or systematically you could ask, for instance, what characteristically, when chemists and physicists or chemists and biologists, what characteristically comes from each of these domains? So for example, during World War II, the, the radio engineers and the physicists had to coordinate their work at MIT and at Harvard. And the physicists said, oh, you know, we had this complicated device. We, we, we know how to solve that. We just use, you know, use our Green's functions and we'll solve it. And the engineers said, sure, go ahead, solve it. And the physicists came back a couple of weeks later. These are some of the best physicists in the world. And they said, we have no idea how to solve this. Um, and the radio engineer said, well, how about this? What we do when we have a problem, like how does a loudspeaker function in a, in a circuit, is we don't try to do the physics of the loudspeaker. We say, what comes in, what goes out? Now let's solve. Ignore what happens in the black box. And the physicist said, oh, that's interesting. And the engineer said, make us a black box. So the physicists began to learn a coordinative, to coordinate their work with the engineers, the physicists providing certain fundamental notions about microwaves and so on, and the engineers providing a whole algebra and way of understanding black box circuitry. So then you can say, okay, so the sort of the syntax, so to speak, is coming from the radio engineers and the vocabulary, the semantics, is coming from the physicists. How does that work and what comes out of that as it begins to be produced? In other words, what I want to push on is what exactly is the coordinative process? How does it change over time? And what does that tell us about the way non-localized knowledge gets produced, about the way from different local settings and different local scientific cultures we produce something that isn't reliant in its entirety on any one of its constituent groups? Let me stop there. Totally wonderful. Totally great. Thank you very much. Um, Lots of questions. Um, uh, who would like to first sort of back here? Maybe in the I, I was really happy to hear the, the Radar Lab example mm -hmm. come up because, of course, um, there's been a decent amount of research done on how cybernetics sort of emerged yeah. as, if not a, a creole coming out of it, but at least a sort of a shared language for mm -hmm. this. Um, my approach into this whole world is um, uh, the, the, the most ig ignoble, which is uh, coming out of the, the venture capital and technology mm -hmm. community. And I, I'm wondering to what extent have people looked at trade languages between um, the engineering community and the business community as have sort of come out of the innovation communities in Silicon Valley, uh, Route 128, so on and so forth. Are we seeing any of these sort of same phenomena come out of that meeting of the scientific language and the commercial language? I think that's a very interesting problem. There's been a little bit of work on it, not a huge amount, but it seems to me a very important area of research, and you can see the impact of it in all sorts of ways. For instance, even in the architecture, when a biology lab is built, um, when, when any laboratory is built, it reflects certain ideals about what where that knowledge sits in the world. Does your laboratory resemble a church? Does your laboratory resemble a factory? Does your laboratory represent, um, you know, I mean, they, these things altered radically. So when laboratory architecture shifted in and after World War II to be these more, you know, traveling cranes and large bay areas, and it took on the ethos of a large-scale factory, not accidentally. I mean, this is, 
These were techniques of architecture and design and production that came out of building the bombers and, and, and other things for, for World War II. And when the people came out of the atomic bomb project and the radar project, they, they began to see themselves as functioning in what they considered to be the non-precious academic, but rather the, an industrial scale uh, sense of, of who they were and what, they're, what they were doing. And they began to say, OK, we can imagine building laboratories the size of cities. We're going to build Fermilab, and we're going to build Brookhaven, and we're going to and and their model was this industrial one, which comes out of economic industrial production, and it began to shift how scientists worked and the kinds of equipment that they used, the scale and scope of of their ambitions. It went, you know, Harvard's budget was in the physics department went from twenty thousand to millions between nineteen thirty nine and nineteen forty. I mean, it was a changed sense of who they were. And in the venture capital inflection of this story, you know, when you begin to see biology or nano labs built with um, lacquered wood and, and <laughs> wall to wall carpeting, and I mean, you know, you have to say, look, you're going to bring in venture capitalists to come and talk about patenting and, and moving beyond the laboratory. They don't want to go to PS 101 circa 1956. <laughs> they don't, that's not what, that's not who they expect you to be. That's not who they are. And the, or for instance, at a more abstract level, a more conceptual level, you know, if you're old enough, you can remember presentations in the sciences, you know, scribbled on overhead projector <laughs> sheets and put on the, you know, flashed on the screen too fast to read. And then, you know, PowerPoints, and there's been a sort of escalation. And the, the idea of presentation in both its venture capital in, you know, economic sense and presentation in its academic sense begin to merge. Because if you're going to present things, the visual language that you use requires not just a generic sophistication, but address a certain visual idiom that's be, that people are used to. So that also, so, and then there's lots of things in between the laboratory and the presentation. But in all sorts of ways, I think the, the role of the industrialization of the sciences and then this new world of venture capital and startup. Uh, has begun to alter not just the biological or biochemical, but also uh, the, the relationship between engineering, physics, chemistry, and biology. <coughs> 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 He's inviting you to become a lead user of user technology. So, um, so this is interesting related to something we're struggling with, which, which is that um, we have people that speak different languages. Not so much Can you guys hear Eric back there? I, I can't hear. Yeah. Sorry. So, kind of so we're, we're doing work on what, what we call, so, so we have users innovating, and they have to deal with manufacturers of a different language. And so what we do is we try to create a toolkit in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, each time you approach, for example, a website, you know, like MATLAB or mm -hmm. Fidelity Investments or something like that, you go in with your language and you're mm -hmm. saying, well, I expect bonds to be over here. Mm -hmm. And traditionally what's happened is that site is totally rigid and one side figures it out. <coughs> but now, you know, with the equivalent methods like Google search and so on, what's happening is they say, oh, you think a bond is a something right. or other, huh? Well, we can figure the site. So the point is that what you're studying over a period of time we actually have to deal with in minor ways mm -hmm. every day. Yes. And so the principles here, you know, of adaptation and, and efficient adaptation are going to be enormously powerful. I mean, that's, that's really important all around. It is. It seems to me very closely related to what interests me and, it, and, and, and an interesting um, specific model of this, of this case. I mean, you, you, the analog in, 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 in physics might be when the physicists, the physicists were used to telling the engineers what to do, right? So when Louis Alvarez, Nobel Prize winner of particle physics, wanted to build something, he, he got engineer, he hired engineers, cryogenic engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, and he said, build me this, and here's what I want. 
And that sort of was fine. It seemed like very big physics at the time. These were million dollar bubble chambers. chambers. But then that, you know, add a zero, add another zero, you're talking $100 million machines. And this started to be a big fraction of the Department of Energy's budget. So now, now you have the physicists saying, OK, well, I changed my mind. We want this shifted. And the engineers said, you sure? That's going to cost $30 million. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, do what we say. This is the better way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the project spiraled out of control. It threatened the whole of the high energy physics program. It threatened the Department of Energy. And finally, the physicists had to go to the engineers and say, you have to learn to say no to us. At this sort of Hegelian master-slave moment, right, where <laughs> the slave with his feet on the ground has to tell the master what's real. And, but the physicists eventually, I mean, their feet were to the fire, understood that. And it's a little bit like the top-down fidelity site that wasn't responsive to the way the users are working. You know, the engineers and the physicists aren't exactly user and innovator, but they're, they, they, it's a unilateral move it turns out to be very destructive and in the limit. And that was only fixed right. when they learned how to have something that was more dialogic and to create something that was not quite either physics or engineering. And eventually in the, in the 1983 event, the Nobel, even the Nobel Prize Committee, not the most radical organization I've ever heard of, split the Nobel Prize between an engineer and a physicist because the world had changed. Right. But now the dilemma is here. So, so in effect, if you think about IBM coming into some company to tell them uh, how to automate their process, right? This is an event that happens every day. They have totally different languages. So they have a person in the middle who is every day having to learn a new language, in effect, and make rough translations. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be an enormous help to think about, really, and we've been sort of thinking about, well, can we get these things to common primitives, or what's the story here? Would be to, to make this more efficient. The, the way they are now doing this, or the way we all speak to each other, mm -hmm. is sort of a guess and by gosh thing. So it really is, you know, the things that you talk about over decades, we're negotiating every minute. Right. So, so now, what are the underlying <coughs> sort of principles you can imagine instilling from this that would allow us to say, oh, okay, I, I can do this in 20 minutes? Um, not not a hard task. Really. <laughs> <laughs> like your project. <laughs> I you know I, I I mean one thing seems to me to try to characterize what it is that the constituent. So it may be that there isn't a generic solution to this problem, and that what one needs to do is to look in the in the collab in the potential coordination, which I prefer to the term collaboration, but in the coordinative process, what is it that's characteristically coming from the different groups? And I mean, I gave the example of radar because there's a place where actually you can say something quite specific about what it was. It was not just any old bit of radio engineering and any old bit of physics. Right, right. It really was characteristic that the, the, the radio engineers had a very, you know, good engineering toolkit. And when they took a problem, they said, voltage in, voltage out. Amperage in, amperage out. You know, they line these up in these equations and make it into a matrix, you solve it. And they, this is what they did every day. And they said, we want this. This is what we need to do to be able to build these radars if we're going right. to have any chance of saving England from right. the Battle of Britain. And so um, the physicists, after much resistance, because they really didn't, they, this was not the way they thought about problems. Right, right. Um, they had to give something up. And they had to give up some very sophisticated tools that date back to the 19th century um, and say, OK, what do we have that the engineers don't, that we can contribute to this problem? And how can we make that work with their toolkit? So what is it from what we do? Well, for instance, let's give up what happens in the limit in some corner of a, of a copper tube, of a copper right, junction. Right, right. We can, because, you know, in physics, you say, well, let's solve it completely, figure it out exactly, get the analytic solution. 
and the engineers could care less. They yeah. want to know what comes in, what goes out. So, so now, now I'm okay. the engineer. I'm okay. saying. Last oh, one, Eric, because we've oh, got I'm sorry. Oh, 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 no, 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 go, go follow okay. on. Now I'm the engineer and say, okay, okay. Up raise a level of abstraction a bit. What is the principle here so that I can do it faster next time? So I, 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 I don't know. Shut up in a generic it. way, the only thing I can say is try. It, in the case, say, of IBM with these various companies, more generally than asking for just a facilitator who is good man for all jobs, I would say try to figure out what characteristically IBM is contributing to these things and what is part of their culture that actually is fairly irrelevant to these interactions. That's and it turns out that there's a lot of irrelevant stuff. If I trade this for that, you and I do not have to agree that this is for coffee. You can use it as a paperweight. Mm -hmm. It is not relevant to the trade. So part of understanding the dynamics of exchange is knowing what, what doesn't matter. That's a great, great insight. That's great. Yeah. What can you throw away? Uh, Hallie, then Judith. One really quick one. Awesome. One per customer we're going. And then, okay. so Hallie, Judith, David. When you talk about new, wor new language being created, like biochemistry coming together, is it predictive, if there are many new words, that this is a bigger, larger, amazing leap in thought? <laughs> is the language connected? You want an empirical research. I, well, I guess I want to, words, is there a way to innovation. study, and I, I'm thinking, of course, because I'm a net person, mm -hmm. all the crazy terms and words we've had to come up with quickly to try and describe what the heck is going on here. But in a more reasonable place, bio and chemistry, is there a war of words where a combo word won't do and a new word must be created? And does that, is that predictive? Is it telling you something about this is thought that's much bigger than we anticipated? I think that one place that there's a sorting out of this is, is, that, is that in these thick, what I'm calling the thick boundaries. So you might think that a boundary is like a mathematical line, a one dimensional object. But part of what I think is important to see here is that boundaries are always dimensional. They're always thick. They're always like the you know the, the biochemistry in the beginning years, or or geographically, right? The Bosque region is not a line. It's a region that exists on the boundaries between France and Spain. And I think that under, in that in these thick regions of exchange, um, a lot of the vocabulary that was produced by these individual fields gets thrown out because it's sort of endogenous to the originating culture. And they can proliferate, proliferate vocabulary as they wish, but it turns out that when other people start to, when you have these user innovator relationships or exchanges, that there's a stripping away. And so it, in some ways, I think the acid test for the vocabularies is what happens in these boundary regions. I like to think of the Berkman Center as a thick region of exchange on topics related to internet and society. So we'll have to start stripping away extraneous language. Um, Judith, then David. Uh, I know more about IBM than I know about Stuyvesant. Um, Judith, do enough. Do you know Peter Gauss and finish his degree? Close. So MIT yeah, Media Lab professor. So, so um, but I think I was listening to your themes. I think one of the interesting pieces is when, for instance, <coughs> I'll use IBM as an example, not the most egregious one, but when you have something like this. Where a lot of what they are, the, there's a different type of cooperation. While they may be trying to cooperate with their customers, it's a very competitive cooperation. And a great deal of what they're trying to do is use a new language to convince them that they have something new there. And so you see, you know, a new language, a new technology. They're very, very, they're a very fashionable company in the world of management. And it's a lot of it is about kind of trying to promulgate a new way of looking at things, because a lot of it is if it was too easily understood, there wouldn't be something to sell. And a lot of it is selling this notion that there, you know, and that there's lots of management books that come out every year that are about taking the same very simple concept and putting a very complex vocabulary around them so that you feel like you've achieved something new. And so I think the more general point that may be interesting is also um, Part of it is the question of how much is there being cooperation about a competition, and it's and it's competition in the world of information dominance. Mm -hmm. And I think you see in situations like that, information integrity in a somewhat different way, which is not necessarily about cooperating as much as it is about jockeying for position. Well, I think there are two two points you make that both seem to me very important. One is that 
uh, complexification can sometimes be obfuscation, right, and not making more precise the terms. And I think this is <laughs> something, whether it's unintentional in the case of aspects of internet vocabulary, and there's also a kind of intellectual property. Everybody, you know, nobody can write a PhD thesis without introducing new vocabulary <laughs> that they hope will become <laughs> a trendy new thing. Um, and that, there, so there is a kind of incentive like to obfuscate yeah, yeah. or to <laughs> proliferate. And then the second um, aspect is that competition and cooperation are often <coughs> closer together than we think. I mean, Freud once said that ambivalence is the base emotion and, and, and uh, not the lowest emotion, but the <laughs> ground state emotion. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, that we may, we may see, see that here. And that when people coordinate, they may have many different motives. In a way, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is in some ways to pull away from an intentionalist account and to sort of say, at a very minimal level, what is being coordinated? You know, it's a sort of reduced question, a, a simpler question than you might want to ask were you to try to say, well, is one side motivated by the desire for fame or the desire for fortune or the desire for symbolic capital in the, in the, um, in the world of academics? Or what, I mean, I, in a way, I want to sort of bracket that mm -hmm. and say, what is it when people are making these sorts of coordinations goes into that? And then you can ask, you know, there, are, there is a world of other questions you can ask about how these things relate to the starting culture, the endogenous questions. What does it mean within the physics community to be doing this? What does it mean within the chemistry community to be making this coordination? But I want to hold that in a sense bracketed while we ask how the coordination works. And then we can sort of build out from there. David, Wendy, Oliver, then maybe I'll wake up too, but we'll see. Um, depending on how long the questions are and the good responses. I would love just to drop a footnote, though, on the term intellectual property, which you and Judith glazed over, but threw out there temptingly to us as IPR lawyers. In the event that <laughs> Wendy doesn't raise this, um, <laughs> she may well, as a professor of intellectual property, um, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on whether or not the best of what um, you're talking about is either promoted by the current intellectual property regime or blocked by it or otherwise. I realize that might fall in the motivation range mm -hmm. that you're trying to bracket, but to the extent mm -hmm. that you have insights that might help us think about mm -hmm. this core area of our work, that'd be great. Um, but that's more of a discussion kind of, if we get to it, kind of question. David? So can we just get to it? <laughs> well, no, I'd love to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> bad, yeah, bad, bad, bad. No, no, I'd like to hear the answer to that question. I, I cede my time to the gentleman. <laughs> I wasn't actually meaning to hijack the process. I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss this in the entire hour. So I will put the point to the question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind if okay. you want to ask yeah, a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 um, and Wendy will ask something on this zone, so I'm not too worried. Th this is just a, a clarification of a uh, question. So um, when two fields are, we negotiate these sorts of understandings all the time, right? Um, at a, mac a micro level, so right. that. Um, Pick on Ethan. So when Ethan says groovy, which he doesn't say, but if he were to say groovy, when Ethan says groovy, I understand he's being sarcastic. All right, so it's a little you know, micro thing. Groovy. <laughs> 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 um, when two cultures, uh, two, well, two cultures in, uh, in the, your sense um, are negotiating in the thick zone, um, does the language that they come up with strictly is? Are there primitives behind it? So uh, the language is a simplification of what's being said. Um, which would require that there be some sense of primitive. Or do they, uh, and, and which also might mean that they, um, their own internal senses of what they're doing has changed because now they've seen that somebody else is calling it this. The two, well, go, two, two fields are calling it intellectual property, and suddenly the users who start calling it intellectual property say, oh, it's property. Uh, that changes things. So it, does it strip away? Is it a, is it a reduction? Um, does it uh, affect? Each of the theories, so to speak, the sort of theoretical space of each of the uh, of of the fields, um, or do they translate uh, back into their original own terminology, where the term is richer and thicker and more ambiguous and, and has more semantics? Really? Okay, um, this is a very interesting question, and I think um, so. I want to make a distinction between regularization and simplification, and here's what I have in mind: when we, we humans have the capacity to change register in the way we speak. 
we know how to speak to children, we know how to speak to foreigners, we know how to speak to technical people, we know how to, I mean, you we have different... You speak to smart people, you speak We know how to do things. Now, uh, in a kind of metaphorical way, when one of the things that you do in language, so below the level of the kind of conceptual high-level structures that we're talking about is, in English, you can regularize to subject, verb, object. This SVO structure is, we don't always speak in subject, verb, object, but we can do much more complicated things in English than that, but that's something that we do. Now, does that mean that the, or we take, um, you know, phonetically, we make, you know, consonant, a consonant vowel, consonant vowel is much simpler to communicate with, oops, I shouldn't say that, it's, it's easier to, to grasp um, in some ways for a non-speaker than consonant, consonant, you know, some very complicated structured consonants. And um, semantically, too, there are ways that we regularize things. And so the regularization doesn't, however, mean that you're simplifying the ideas. There used to be a whole, you know, 19th century linguistics was dominated by also, you know, the Dutch thought that the Dutch language was the superior language that could <laughs> explain serious ideas, and the German thought you could only <clears throat> philosophize in German or you're wasting your time, and the English and the French each had their own views, right? So there are plenty of tracks that will tell you that every major imperial Ger European language was the only language to do X in. Nobody believes that anymore. And um, I think that. If you look at, or, or a more technical example would be when uh, two famous physicists, Bjorken and Drell, wrote a book on quantum field theory, they wrote a second volume for experimenters. And you say, oh, this is going to be simple. It's for their poor cousins, the experimenters. And it's true, there were all sorts of intra-theoretical co connections that were dropped out and regularizations of the rules that were used to calculate things. But the calculations got more complex. Because now the experimenters really wanted to know what happened when a spinning electron hit a such and such. And whereas the theorists, you know, they just want to know the framework. And whether something old, I mean, they had more abstract, endogenous theoretical questions. So this is an example of something that is, along one axis, more regular, but more complex in calculational terms. I think that's actually what happens a lot. So that when we take a field and we're speaking to another field, we try to regularize things. We try to not deal with the relationship between terms in our own field so much, but rather to look at the connective tissue to the other field. So the answer to your question, is this simplification? I would say, careful. Because simplification can occur a lot. Simple is not a simple concept. And there are different axes. You could, and the example that I gave, there's simplification in terms of endogenous theoretical connections. Yes, it got simpler along that. In calculational dimension, it got more complicated. And so what I would say is the outspeak becomes regularized. Then your second part of your question was, does this feed back into the originary, one of the originary or constitutive parent languages or parent cultures? And I think the answer is yes. And that's actually what interests me most. The sort of dog bites man story to me is you know, physics teaches, chemistry teaches, biology teaches, psychology, you know, the sort of Kantian story that that doesn't grab me much, place, right? <laughs> um, the sort of pyramidical notion of knowledge. I'm much more interested in the man bites dog story, like the radar story, where the physicists learned by their interaction with the radio engineers. Then they went back and Schwinger rewrote the most fundamental kind of physics, quantum field theory, using this black box attitude towards. So that happens. And so I think, yes, that's particularly interesting to me when the very fact of the coordinative activity begins to shift to backform the originary scientific culture. I think that happens all the time. And it's really, really interesting. And it's what happens in the analogous structure here would be if, if what if Fidelity actually learned something, not just how to sell their stuff, but they actually learned about how to think about their 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 instruments, their financial instruments on the basis of their interaction with their users, and that must happen unfortunately. But the but the top down picture not only is bad business, but it actually keeps you from learning. 
excellent editorial comment. That's an awesome question. And the thing most striking about it is that our university or other universities do not even forget the um, dog bites man story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it's wonderfully right here. <laughs> Some of us still need to do some more work back here, I think. Uh, well, d despite being an intellectual property attorney, um, and despite being interested in your question, that wasn't the direction I was thinking of either. I, I was thinking about from the direction of uh, an attorney who uh, goes out and learns lots of different disciplines and um, is called on, or Just in a former life, was, was called on to litigate in different disciplines and to go in and learn a little bit um, and then go out and present that back to partners or judges or clients. Right. Um, so I was going to ask sort of about the role of sort of formal education in this different disciplines versus the sort of learning on the job that you get from working with someone in a technical field and learning from them uh, what they're doing. Um, you know, some law firms would go out and hire biochemists to go and talk to the biochemistry clients, and others would go out and hire um, generally interested people and send them in to go and uh, learn. And my, my thinking uh, tends to be that uh, the generally interested people would learn more that was then helpful to explain it to a non-biochemist, judge, jury, uh, and senior partner. I wonder if that's anything. You're, you're, sorry, I didn't understand the very last bit. You said it's more useful to? Uh, that when you're trying to uh, then go back and explain to people outside of the, the specific discipline that someone who learns it from the ground up can then go and teach others um, and in the process learn something uh, for their own disciplines as yeah. well versus somebody who's gotten the formal education in uh, a different field uh, and may know different silos but not the way they fit together. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, I think there's a, a pedagogical confusion that is visible in our, in our uh, writing about, in writing in our culture about <laughs> science that's, that's very related to this, which is, it seems to me that I mean, people often think that what's wanted in a book or an article or an explanation about science is to, is to, is to make it stupider. And um, that, that seems to me empirically wrong. That is to say, people actually are pretty smart. I mean, a broad range of people are quite smart. Our culture has a lot of technical people who, or who deal with technical things, whether they're in the medical field or whether they're um, engineers. Or I mean, the numbers of the numbers are very, very large, actually. And we write about science in explaining it um, as if they're as if we're talking to stupid people, and even people who are not in technical fields deal with very complicated concepts. And it seems to me that pedagogically, what we need to do is to develop ways of speaking about technical scientific ideas in ways that are not weighed down by jargon, that don't require prior knowledge, but that recognize the sophistication of conceptual reasoning that the audience is, in fact, capable of. And we don't do that very well. And it has terrible consequences. It means that, you, you know, if you go to an art museum, <clears throat> you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and you know, some great art historian like Svetlana Alpers is organizing a Rembrandt show, it's written for adults. If you go to a science museum, it's written for children. And um, I'm not saying, you know, you should have an exhibit that requires people to be able to solve a partial differential equation or they won't understand what's going on. That's stupid. But you don't have to address people using one-syllable words and assuming that the entire audience wants to climb on the exhibit. <laughs> I, I like climbing the exhibit. But, um, but it seems to me that a lot of times that what goes wrong in the interaction between the scientists and the non-scientists is that the scientists or people writing in their name think that the translation dimension, the translation mechanism is making it conceptually stupid. And that's just ridiculous. 
we don't do it in other places in the world. If we, you know, if you pick up Art Forum or something like that, which has got a gigantic circulation, or the New York Times Arts page, or the New York Times <coughs> Book Review section, or um, the way, even the way people describe, you know, you listen to the radio and you hear the arguments about what Petraeus is saying. I mean, we have pretty sophisticated discussions. So suddenly when it comes to science, we feel like we mistake on the one side jargon or technical manipulation with on the other side the sophistication of an argument. And I think if we could get that right, it would allow people to bring back this information in the, whether it's in the legal or the ethical or the, the other domain. I mean, some of the things that I've been talking about here I, I have come up with in political context where groups that are as interested, say, in or there's one group in Switzerland where the soil scientists and the farmers were ready to kill each other. And the soil scientists wanted to regulate <coughs> things about the way the farmers farmed, and the farmers said, you don't know what you're talking about. Or the lobster men in Maine, you know, they think lobsters do X and Y and Z, and the Bureau of Fisheries says, no, 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 that's not what lobsters do. And um, so in a way, uh, and what some of these groups have been talking with me about is how to find ways of talking that sit between where, where the, the soil scientist and the farmer could actually coordinate what they're saying. Not because the farmers are going to suddenly become soil scientists or the soil scientists are going to take out a farm, it, but rather that there is enough, that, that we, one can build up enough common language and experience to be able to speak to one another. Uh, the last question. Um, I actually, it was largely answered, so I, I will cede my time if you would like to make it then. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't mean to tease Sorry. you. Such a question. I'll, I'll make it slightly more precise, which was just to sort of see the um, uh, person's better interest than I do, generally speaking. You have plenty of ways in which what you've said already is obviously quite um, uh, uh, relevant to our work, but um, take patents as just one example of intellectual property. Um, one might argue, based on what you've suggested, that um, the uh, notion that um, we see in individuals often um, the exclusive right to do something with an idea or a set of ideas over a period of time um, is a bad idea. And it's a bad idea because um, there are a bunch of conversations that might be going on in cooperative mode um, that in fact would make something more innovative for society and that the lockup that we achieve in intellectual property is a bad idea in fact. Others might say, no, in fact, one of the great things about the patent system is the force of closure, right? Mm -hmm. and at some point in the process, you need to disclose a certain amount of information about your innovation. Um, or you might say, um, in fact, the patent is a regime that helps to organize groups of people who are working together on innovation, and they collectively can hold them accountable. So you can see people making you know, um, multiple arguments for whether or not your findings, or at least the mm -hmm. um, implications of the questions you are um, asking, might be supportive of or um, uh, that IP is um, uh, wrongly thought about in the context of patent. I just wonder if you had, had thoughts on well, that. Well, it's a really interesting question. And so let me just take, two, I mean, it's a gigantic cluster. Right, right. So let me just take two aspects of it. One is um, I actually think the idea of completely individual innovation is sort of mytho-poetic in some ways, right? I mean, we don't... Does anybody believe? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. in science, but we have institutions that are constantly trying to recuperate it. Right. I mean, the Nobel Prize is the best example. Sorry to pick on Stockholm, but, right, we have experiments that are starting now with... You can still give them one, you guys, over, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> over 2,000... Very nice and smart. <laughs> with over 2,000 people on an experiment, right? right? And that's just the people who are signatories. That doesn't include all the engineers and the what does that mean, right? If you, you know, eventually one of these experiments will get a Nobel Prize, and they'll give it to two people, or the legal limit three. And, um, but it's it's really trying to imagine ourselves back to a non-existent Edenic past, right, which Newton's which which never really, you know, something. it was always we've always been just after the fall, right? In the in the nineteenth, <laughs> <laughs> there was always a time when. Things were more individual and so on, but it's it's like you know chasing the sunset or something. And so I I think that in science, as in engineering, 
innovation always has aspects of collectivity, which is not to say that individuals don't make identifiable contributions, but it never has the pure crystalline form that our institutions often demand to make promotions, to hire people, to reward them, to give them grants. I mean, we have a, a large scale structure on the academic symbolic side, or not so symbolic side, like tenure, and um, that, that a reward system that tries to recuperate, that isolate and draw a sharp line around the individual. And in the patent and then the engineers are much more experienced, they're much more integrated with the engineering world, with the uh, patent world than the scientists. And it's interesting to see what happens when these paths cross. For instance, in the beginning of Silicon Valley Route 128 time, um, there was intense efforts to try to get all these new radar devices, which the beginning of 128 is, um, and uh, Silicon Valley also, uh, to try to get patents out of this. And there were tensions because, for instance, the, the companies wanted the scientists to do all the variations possible. Okay, so you've made a this kind of resonator. Well, it can be modified this way or that way. It can exclude this and you can use a different substance and you can use a different voltage. I mean, so the, the, the patent people were pushing them to do a kind of intellectual work that the physicists didn't want to do. They, they found the thing, now they wanted to you know, plug it in and use it, sell something else. But So that's a case where there's tension there. On the other side, I think you're quite right in one part of your question saying that the, the patents can be an enormous incentive. And the end, as engineering and science grow closer together, which I think is the characteristic ethos of this time, um, in the nano world, for instance, um, you know, questions of the existence of something is less important than its robustness and its being able to produce it in molar and not molecular quantities. And so, I mean, it's, you know, it, there's a kind of engineering ethos that has begun to backform in the sciences. So, my colleagues over here in physics, you know, are, you know, begun more and more to be able to think more like engineers in certain respects along these lines. And I think the patents and intellectual property and the start possibility of startups and so on has a is an incentive and does you know pull people together and who you need to do what and and also tends to make us maybe a little bit less interested in the classical philosophical ontological questions that have been such a part of physics you know, certainly since Newton and maybe since Lucretius and um, and more thinking like engineers. And I don't say that in a wistful, elegiac way. I mean, I'm just, I, I just think that's a fact, that that is shifting the way physics feels in some ways. And I think that's happening across many scientific disciplines. So the patents and intellectual property play a very complicated role in the changing ethos of the relationship between science and technology. I'm sure that I am speaking for everybody here, but this was a Remarkable, remarkable tour de force in this area. And your comment about not dumbing science down too far, I was actually going to close by suggesting there's this tension that Richard Wittgenstein and others do have found ways to speak to non scientists in your field truly intelligently. And I feel like, though I was afraid at the beginning, I would not know what you're talking about. I learned a large number of new words as it went along. Um, that you made it, um, the true insights, extraordinarily accessible to those of us with less specialized knowledge in your field. So well, thank you. Many, many thanks.